If you have your Bibles, I would like to uh, invite you to join me. Um, we're actually going to look at two different passages of Scripture. So we're going to start off in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and we're going to look at a couple of verses there. And then we're going to go over to Luke chapter 9 um, and, and look at some verses there as well. So um, as we jump into this, we have been talking about, last week we started talking about uh, answering this question, why should I? Uh, why should I? And we're going to fill in uh, with a couple of different things of addressing some of those questions on uh, things that I think every Christian wrestles with at some point in time. So like last week, we talked about why should I trust God? Uh, why should I trust? Um, and, and we talked about that a little bit. And today I want to talk about surrendering. Uh, surrendering is one of those words um, that we use a lot in the church, um, but we don't use a lot anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's, it's something that we, we tend to not use. Or if we do, it is with a negative uh, connotation when it's out in the world. Uh, but in the church, it's supposed to be this, this great thing when we surrender. And as such, we have mixed emotions when it comes to surrendering. And so a lot of Christians, we find ourselves wondering uh, at various parts in our lives, uh, when, we, when we are in relationship with him and when we get closer and closer to God, as he asks us to surrender, we find ourselves at this juxtaposition of why. Why should I fo uh, follow in this, in this path that is selfless, is uh, costly, and, and, and is difficult sometimes? Why should I go that direction? And so we want to kind of address that a little bit today uh, and take a look at uh, what God has to say about it and, and kind of uh, discuss that a little bit. So in Romans chapter 12, we have uh, the first two verses of Romans 12 are very familiar verses. Um, but this is kind of where we are um, instructed to live this life of surrender. So in Romans chapter 12, sorry, the microphone is kind of funky. Um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and perfect will. Let's jump over to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And before I read the verses that are in there, let me kind of set the table of what's happening in this situation. Jesus has been walking with his disciples for a little bit of time now. Um, it's unclear exactly how long, but probably at least a year in his earthly ministry with his disciples. And he comes to this moment where he takes the 12 and he uh, wants to encourage them uh, to go bigger than what they had ever gone before, to do things that they had never done before. Matter of fact, uh, he sends them out away from him. It is the only time in his three-year earthly ministry where they depart from his presence and they go elsewhere to do ministry and then for a, a season of time and then come back. But he gives them specific instructions when he sends them out. And when he sends them out, those instructions are very interesting to look at. And, and some of the different Gospels address it differently, but basically he sends them out into these different cities and into the countryside, and he has them take absolutely nothing with them. They can't pack their lunch or even a change of clothes for the next day or anything. Just go. And go into these different locations and share the gospel message, the good news of salvation and, and forgiveness and all of this. Uh, and then he, he uh, tells them that he's going to empower them to do great things uh, and all of this sort of thing. And so he sends them out uh, in this capacity, which is a big deal um, that he's sending fishermen and tax collectors and, and, and zealot warriors and all of these different individuals to go and do ministry. And, and without taking your bags with you, no backup plan. You're not taking money along. You're not taking uh, any sort of provision. You're not taking uh, creature comforts or any of those things. I have to imagine that the disciples might have been like, wait a minute, what? You want me to do what? And so we find him encouraging the disciples to go and do this. They go. 
They come back after time. They report what's going on. Luke doesn't address really so much of what happened when they came back as much as uh, Matthew does. Um, But after they come back, we move on in the next phase of the story. And so after they come back, Jesus begins teaching. And as he's teaching, a large crowd uh, follows him and gathers. And there comes to this point where the disciples come to Jesus. And again, this is a familiar story. The disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, we need to send these people home so that they can get food. And Jesus says, well, why don't you go ahead and feed them? And there's this whole, what do you mean? We're going to feed them. They gather what they have. It's just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Jesus blesses it, multiplies it, feeds 5,000, right? Beautiful story. And yet, it's a beautiful story because we have the greatness of reading it, not living it. (laughs) If you're one of the disciples, when Jesus says, you feed them, that's an intimidating story yet to be told. Um, If you're one of the disciples that Jesus is about to go and send into this city where people have never heard of Jesus before and and to proclaim who he is and relationship about him and forgiveness and teach this message, knowing that Pharisees have already started to oppose Jesus and, and all of this without the benefit of our hindsight that we have, this would be a scary story yet to be told. And all of these things, and Jesus, he he turns to his disciples after all of this, and he says to them some very sobering words. After everything has transpired that I just set the table for you, in verse 23, we pick up with this. Then Jesus said to them all, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? Father God, I come to you right now and I just pray that you would open our ears to your word and to your truth. God, help us to see who you are in greater clarity and light God, help us to come to this moment where we lay aside anything else that gets in our way of focusing in on what you would share with us today through your Holy Spirit, through your word. God, I pray this for every man, woman, and child in this place, wherever this place is, online, here, doesn't matter, that we would just turn our focus and our attention to you and to what you're doing, who you are, Open our eyes that we can see you clearly. Open our eyes that we can see the world around us more clearly. Open our eyes that we can see ourselves more clearly. And understand just who you are and what you've called us to. God, help us to listen to your spirit, your still small voice. Pray that that's what we hear and nothing else. So, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God. In Jesus' name I do pray. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, is one of those memory verses that I remember learning. I don't remember how old I was exactly. I could probably start to put together the pieces because I remember exactly when I had to learn it in vacation Bible school of my a uh, little country church that I went to growing up. I had to have been maybe nine uh, years old-ish, right around there. And the reason I remember this was because the church had implemented this thing where during vacation Bible school, you could memorize verses and earn points. And you could also bring your Bible every day and earn points. And if you invited friends, you could earn points. And if you had a certain amount of points, then you could redeem them for tangible things that little boys like, like little army men and stuff like that. And there was a particular set that I was saving up for. And I came across this verse in in one of our, our sets of verses to memorize. And I remember working hard at memorizing this verse. And it's a great verse, don't get me wrong. But at that age, memorizing it, I didn't really understand what it was saying. You know what I'm saying? 
Um, matter of fact, it's one of those verses that throughout my adult life and teenage years and all of the, the moments in between when I memorized it, I have quoted it oftentimes. And to some level, I would say that I have started to really understand Luke 9, 23 a little bit more as the years have gone on. But I would be really honest with you if I say this, and it's really true, that I don't think I will ever fully understand every bit of what Jesus is actually saying here. I get the idea. I get the premise. But to really understand it means that I live this life of total surrender to God all the time where I am completely in denial, uh, in, in denial, I'm completely denying my self-urges uh, of, of pride or judgment or uh, even self-motivation and, and all of those uh, criteria that come into how I ascertain a situation around me or, or how I plan my day or week. And I'm, I'm literally surrendering all of that to let God dictate every single moment of it. And in truthfulness, I say that that's what I want to do, and it is what I want to do. But as life goes on, we find ourselves, or I find myself oftentimes still checking in with myself of what I want to do or how I feel about that person or that situation. And there I miss what this verse is talking about all over again. So I bring all of this up to say simply this. Surrender. That's a word, like I said, that we use oftentimes in the church as this great thing to, uh, to stretch forward towards, to uh, try to attain someday. It's this great glory word, a trophy we can hang on our shelf, if you will. Um, but it doesn't come easy. And oftentimes we, we don't really get it, and we don't understand what it really means. So I kind of want to address that for a moment and ask that question that I have asked myself numerous times. In this situation, why should I surrender to you, God? In this moment, why should I surrender? Why, God, is surrender such a big deal? Why should I surrender to you? I'm not even asking the question of what is surrender today. Um, I just really want to answer that question of why should I even bother with surrendering to you? And it's a tough, it's a tough battle within me because here's the thing. Like I've already pointed out to you, it's not easy. And, and, and every bit of who I am fights against it. Every bit of me fights against it. Let me, let me make that a little clearer for you. What I mean by that is, is very simply, it is our human nature to take care of ourselves as best as possible. Um, it is our human nature to fight for our own survival. That's just the way human, humanity is. If you uh, were um, uh, thrown into, into the depths of water uh, and, and with weight tied around your feet, um, you would not just say, okay, here we go, I'm done you would struggle to try to undo the weight so you could get out of the depth of water, correct? It is natural reaction. Uh, if somebody tries to hold their hand over your mouth and nose, at first you might think, okay, this is weird or it's some kind of a joke, but if they don't let up, eventually you're going to try to free yourself, correct? It is human nature. Instinct kicks in. We, we take care of ourselves. If we are hungry, we go and we find food if we can. If we are in danger, we try to find ourselves in a safer location or a situation where it's better for us. It is human nature to take care of ourselves. In the same way in our world, it becomes very much that way in the way that we live all of our lives. Not just on instinct moments where we are in survival mode, but even on things where it has nothing to do with survival, but just how I orient my day. When I, when I get up and I have a day off of work, what do I do with that day? Do I spend that day doing things I enjoy or the things that I really need to get done? Well, if it's a good day off of work, hopefully I can find a balance between the two, right? And so we try to, we try to orient the day about what best fits us. That is the natural human um, behavior. It is the natural flow of things, that we take care of ourselves, we look after ourselves. 
Now, don't get me wrong. We have the capacity to care for others. Uh, I think any parent in the room would know that you have that capacity to take care of your child, even above yourself when your baby is newborn. Uh, you sacrifice a whole lot of sleep um, so that that baby might get a few moments of sleep, right? And, and, and we learn in those moments how selfless we actually can become. We also find out in those moments how selfish we actually are, right? Let's be honest. Um, and, and so uh, we do have this capacity to look after the needs and, and, and the concerns of others around us, absolutely. And so what I'm saying is if we're not surrendering to God, I'm not saying that you are a totally selfish person and you don't care about anyone else. I'm also not saying that if you are a selfless person and, and perfectly all about other people, then you're in right relationship with God. That's not what I'm saying either because it's a whole lot more than that. But if you are in relationship with God, what we find is that God wants to reorient the way that we see the world to no longer see the people around us in the way that we saw them before, but now to see them through the eyes of him. To judge people, not according to our standards, but according to God's grace and love in their life. God calls us to renew the way we think. Oh wait, that's that passage in Romans. He calls us to be transformed, to change. And all of this is part of growing in relationship with God. And all of this requires us to come to these moments of surrendering our own sin nature, our own uh, thought process, uh, putting ourself in the right order of things, if you will. Matter of fact, if we were to continue on reading in that Romans chapter 12 passage, after verses 1 and 2, we come to verse 3. Um, that's how numbers work, by the way, one, two, three. Uh, after that, we come to verse three, and if you recall verse three, what we find is this moment where the Apostle Paul says, hey, none of you should think of yourselves more highly than you really are. But instead, you need to have, and this is his phrase, sober judgment about who you really are. Now, Paul's not saying put yourself down, you're nothing. I think Christianity has misconstrued that uh, humility to be that I'm nothing. Um, instead, he is saying with sober judgment, meaning orient yourself in the right place on the list of priorities. God, his wisdom, his direction, his knowledge, his love is always greater than yours. And that is this huge piece of surrender. It's really difficult because up until then, everything has been about us being in that first position and our own wisdom and our own understanding, our own orientation of what we want to do. All of that takes precedence. And God says, wait a minute, I want to recalibrate how you think. I want to hit the reset button and reprogram you to think the way that I do. I want to fill you with my spirit and allow you to do things differently in this world. All it takes is you dying to self. That's super nice and easy, right? No. You see, all of what this passage of Scripture is, both of these passages of Scripture, is about hard, hard things. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, he must daily deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The people he was speaking this to didn't know that Jesus was going to die on a cross yet. The people he was speaking this to didn't know that he was going to be buried in a tomb for only three days and then rise again. The people he was speaking to did not know that he was going to ask Thomas to go ahead and put your hands in these, in these nail scars. And, and the people that he was speaking this to did not know that he was going to ascend right in front of their eyes into heaven. And all of those things, they did not see glory in a cross. The people he spoke this to saw the cross as a means of execution. It would be like us hearing somebody say, hey, if you want to follow me, you must get rid of all of your own ambition and uh, have lethal injection in your life every day. Wait, what? Yeah, that's the essence of what Jesus is saying. You must daily deny yourself and, and, and lay down on the lethal injection table on your own will. Take up your cross. That's what he's saying. He's asking them to die. 
Now, not physically die. He's asking them to die to self, that sin nature within us. And anytime anyone asks me to die, I'm going to say, why should I do that? Right? It sounds really easy to say that we die to self and we follow God and we put him first and, and his plans are best and all of these things, but why in the world should I actually do it when it's hard? When it's not just an idea, but it's actually what's happening in my life. When it's actually what's happening around me. Well, I want to give you a couple of uh, reasons why. First, why should I surrender to God and his will and his direction instead of mine? Well, the Apostle Paul actually gives us the first one here. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 1, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, and that is maybe our first reason why should we, we should surrender to God and not just uh, do things our own way. Because we instead have changed our view instead of looking at our own lives and how we can work things out for our own benefit. Instead, we need to view God's mercy in our lives. Now, to really understand this, you need to maybe get a little theological for a moment and, and, and read the rest of Romans. And what you will find up until now is that Paul has labored uh, very hard for the first several chapters in Romans to uh, convince us how sinful we really are. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Now, we know that as an idea, but he wants us to own our own sin, to realize that that sin that we judge everybody else by is still alive in us, that we all sin. And we all fall short of the glory of God. But then he also is reiterating to us the weight of that sin. And that sin is not just something to dismiss and say, okay, well, we all do it. It's no big deal. He is saying in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, and the wages of that sin or the cost of that sin is death. It costs you everything. If it's unpaid for, your soul will be dead. But the gift of God is everlasting life. And now Paul starts to build on this, this theme of, of, of God's grace and love in our lives. How God redeems us, heals our sin-sick souls. If we just confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, verse, uh, eight, or sorry, chapter 8, verse 1 says that when we are in Christ Jesus, we are no longer condemned by that sin issue that he had just spelled out for us in chapter 6. And in chapter 10, he gives us the recipe of coming into right relationship with God and, and believing in our heart with all of who we are and who God is and all of those sorts of things. And he's laid this great foundation for us. And then, and then he says, now your view should have changed. If you have really allowed God to be in relationship with you and you have been in relationship with him, you need to view the world not the way that you've always seen it. You need to quit looking at other people the way that you've always looked at them. You need to quit looking at your own life and your own trajectory of life and your own motivations in life the way that you always have. And now you need to view all of those things through the lens of God's mercy and grace. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. At the very beginning of his instructions, Paul, before he even asks the church to say, hey, yes, I'm going to surrender to God, he already knows they're going to say, why should I? And he says, because you're not seeing the world through human eyes anymore. Now you need to see the world through the eyes of God's grace and mercy. Let me put it to you this way. In the view of God's grace and mercy, without even looking at everyone else. I just look at my own life. And I can point out how many times I've fallen short. Right? I am very much aware of the own, my own sin in my life. And you probably are as well, of your sin in your life. Right? I'm not asking you to look at anybody else right now. Just look at your own life. We are aware of our sin-sick souls. We are aware of our best self falling short. Have you ever had one of those days where you're like, today's going to be a great day, and then it turns out just absolutely terrible? You have done everything you could to make it a good day, and everything else around you made it terrible. 
and you acted out maybe not the way you wanted to in some of those moments through that day? You see, our best self falls short, right? So just looking at myself, I see this sin sickness. But when I view the world through the lens of God's mercy, when I see how merciful and loving and gracious God actually is, that changes everything. Because now I can see that his mercy is far greater than my plans ever would have been. His mercy and forgiveness in my life is far greater than my best deeds or my best action. And so the answer of why should I surrender to God is simply because his mercy and his grace is greater than anything that I could have ever manufactured or conjured of my own ability. And when I view the world through his mercy, through his grace, I cannot help but come to this moment of saying, all right, God, I'm all in with what you're doing. It's no longer about what I'm doing because, God, I know that I can't do it of my own ability because now I can see how truly great you are. So the number one answer to why should I surrender to God is because we have a good view when we're in relationship with him of just how great his mercy is. Because of God's mercy, we can walk in surrender. During World War II, uh, many of you know that I love history. Um, And I read a lot of history. And I love studying World War II. During World War II, there came a point after a while where the United States military forces were were invading various islands and taking back uh, sections that the Japanese had formerly uh, occupied and trying to uh, push back and, 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 and fight back in those areas. They came to this island called Okinawa. Um, the Battle of Okinawa has been well uh, documented and, 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 and well studied and all the things that are there. I'm not going to get into the logistics of that. But what's interesting, and the reason I'm bringing this up, is the Japanese uh, authorities had so convinced not just the soldiers uh, that lived on the island of Okinawa, but also the civilians, that the Americans, when they conquered, if they conquered, would not treat them well. Not only that they would not treat them well, they actually convinced the, um, they convinced the civilian population that the American soldiers would cannibalize them, that they would eat them. I'm not making this up. This is true. And they convinced the civilians of this so that they would fight back. And, and they convinced them of this so much so that after the United States forces were becoming victorious and taking over the island, there is this very famous set of pictures, and it's very quite sad, where there is a U.S. soldier and a group behind him, and they are trying to convince these civilians to come to safety. And instead, this mom with her toddler child jumps off a cliff to her death. Surrender was incredibly difficult for this mom. The idea of surrendering was impossible because she did not trust that she would be treated well. If she had known the truth, that literally the United States military forces had all kinds of resources to feed them, clothe them, take care of the civilians, would she have taken her life and her toddler's life over the edge of that cliff? Probably not. If she had a view of the mercy of those soldiers who were wanting to rescue her. Now that's a sad story of reality of what happened, but we do it spiritually all the time. When we don't have a view of God's mercy, we think that our way is better, even though it might cost us and be painful and all of those sorts of things. And so we say, why would I surrender when my option is right in front of me? But God, if we have his view of mercy, we see that his option is so much better if we would just surrender to him. 
So why should I surrender to the Holy Spirit in my life? Why should I surrender to God's plan for my life? Why should I surrender to his calling and, and, and all of those sorts of things? Because his mercy changes everything. And once I put on the glasses of seeing the truth of who his, or how his mercy is, my perspective is opened wide up. But I would also like to share that that's not the only reason. Why should I surrender to God? I would also answer because of God's wisdom. It's not just that he is merciful, he is, but he is also a wise God. And we talked about this a little bit last week when we asked the question of why should I trust? And, and it still falls uh, true. We should trust God because he is wise and he knows more than we do about the situation. But we should also surrender to him because he is a wise God. His wisdom is greater than our wisdom and he has greater plans for us because of his wisdom. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says it this way, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is God speaking to his people, by the way. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my thoughts are better than yours. You see, God knows all the details when many of those details are hidden to us. God knows what is in store for you tomorrow. He knows what is in store for you next week, next month, next year, or even as simple as your next breath. God knows what's waiting around the corner for you, but even beyond what's coming, he also knows the plans he has for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans for a hope and a future. Those aren't my words. That's the word of God over our lives. And when we have that view of how great God is, his wisdom to see beyond what is right in front of us, it's easy to walk and surrender to someone who knows what's laying ahead of us rather than trying to forge our own path. It's easy to surrender to their direction, their will, their purpose when we know that they know the answers. So why should I surrender to God? One, because he is a merciful God and he, he has no intentions of harming me, but also because he is a wise God and he knows the best possible path for me to take. Not just for his benefit, although that's true, but also for my benefit. Remember, the Word of God tells us that if we are in relationship with God, then we will lack no good thing. That we will, uh, we will find great satisfaction in following God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of the other things will be added into your life. This idea that if we just recalibrate and su surrender to who He is, His wisdom, his mercy, those two things, they come together and they present a much better path than the one that you could have forged through the jungle of life. Which leads me to the last one I want to share with you. And that is simply because it is honestly, it's in your best benefit to follow God, surrender Him, surrender to Him. In other words, it's pleasing to you. It's not just pleasing to God. We're not surrendering to God just to please him, although there is that part of it, it is also, when we're really boiling it down, the best plan for your life as well. It is pleasing to you when you walk with God. Paul says it here in this passage of Scripture in, 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 in Romans. He says in verse 2, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the, the surrender process that he's talking about. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will for your life. See, God's intention isn't to make you suffer. A lot of times we, we have that negative view in the church, that surrender means suffering. That surrender means that God is going to make me do something I don't want to do. That God is going to send me someplace I don't want to go. Now, I can't tell you where God's going to send you and what he's going to call you to do, 
But I can tell you that when you have a view of his mercy and grace and, and understand the wisdom of who he is and walk in right relationship with him, your path following him will actually be pleasing to you as well. Paul says it a different way in, in, in another section of Romans. He says that we will never be disappointed when we are in relationship with him. You see, following God is the best best path because he is wise. Following God is the best path because he is merciful. But following God is the best path because it's, it's simply, it is the best. In the Old Testament, we have this, this, uh, this verse that I, I think is wonderful. Now, we are encouraged to do this. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. See, the author is telling us to just step out and surrender to who he is, and you're going to find that it's going to be really satisfying. It's going to be really good to be in relationship with God. It's going to be really pleasing to your life and in your life when we surrender to who he is. When God created the world, he placed Adam and Eve in this wonderful, perfect garden. They didn't have to work. They had no pain. They had no suffering. Everything was right in front of them. His desire is to be pleasing in your life. His desire is that when we embrace surrender, that we would find how good he is. It's when we bucket and go our own way that we're cast out of the garden. It's when we don't fall in line with who God is and what he wants that we find ourselves falling so short. Jesus said to his disciples, he's comparing the goodness of God with a father and, and, and a child. What father, if his child asks him for bread, will give him a stone? What father would do that? If it's in our capacity to feed our child, we're going to feed our child, right? In the same way, Jesus continues on, is God's love in our lives. He doesn't, if our child asks us for a fish, we're not going to give him a snake. Now, that's an illustration that seems absurd to me. Um, but apparently it was a real issue. Or not really, but Jesus is making this statement to say how absurd it is to think that his way, following God, is not good. No, God's desire is to give us the bread, the fish, not the snake and the stone. His desire is to bring about a pleasing situation in your life. So why should I surrender? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but I think if we take hold of these three, we will find that surrendering to God becomes a lot easier because they make perfect sense. Why should I surrender? Because God is merciful. Why should I surrender? Because he's wise and knowledgeable and understanding, omniscient. Why should I surrender? Because it's good. It's pleasing to do so. The better question isn't, why should I surrender? The better question is, why shouldn't I surrender to him? And who he is and what he's doing. What are my other options? To continue doing it my way? How's that working out for us? How's that working out for the world? The real question is, why shouldn't I surrender? So God, that's, that's our question. Why shouldn't we surrender to you today in greater measure? Maybe we've surrendered to you in the past and and we're stuck up against that next hard thing and we're asking that question. But the truth is, is the question is, why shouldn't I? Because God, you've been faithful in the past and you'll be faithful again. God, you've, you've been merciful and you will continue to be merciful. You have been wise and you will always be wise. And you will lead me down the path of righteousness. And it will be a pleasing path when I follow you. 
So God, help us to surrender. Help me to surrender to you. It's not a one and done. You said in your word that we must daily do this, that every day we have to choose to follow you, to die out to self, to surrender to who you are, and then we find the fullness of relationship with you. So help us to walk and surrender. God, I thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love and your grace. I thank you for your wisdom. God, I thank you that you, you call us your children, your sons, your daughters, in whom you are well pleased. And I thank you, God, that as your sons and daughters, you bestow upon us these great gifts. You love us. You cherish us. You provide for us. You call us by name. So God, help us to follow you. And I pray this in Jesus' name.